Hello, my name is Patrick and I'm an architect at Pruitt Bisley Architects. As a designer, I'm interested in the relationship between narrative and architecture, and my work aims to explore the peculiarities that make spaces memorable and engaging. Today I'm going to take you through the process of producing a City of London mosaic, but before this I'm going to give a brief overview of my design process and explain why I'm going to make a mosaic today. Producing the mosaic will take more time than is available in this short video, so feel free to pause or rewatch as required. To explain my design approach, I'm going to present three public realm proposals that were produced for LFA competitions. I enjoy undertaking these small and temporary projects because working within the City of London provides a rich historical context for inspiration. In 2018, I designed a bench forming a gravestone for a fictional doc called Geoffrey Barkington. The bench is located at Jubilee Gardens, Houndstitch. Of the potential sites for benches, Houndstitch was especially intriguing. This is because the road is named after a ditch just outside of the London Wall where deceased dogs were disposed of during the 13th century. I wanted to reveal this hidden history, so the proposed bench became a gravestone for a dog. Designing a gravestone presented the question, who was this deceased dog? In order to answer this, I created a fictional dog called Geoffrey Barkington. Geoffrey became a typical London dachshund, and the competition entry contained a series of cartoons illustrating his life. The sketches told of tube journeys, dog grooming, days at the office, and attending parties. The bench was cast from self-compacting concrete using a recycled aggregate and weighs about one tonne. It's formed of a concrete block with a silhouette of a dachshund cut through it. The stainless steel plate cast into the face of the bench states, here lies Geoffrey Barkington, his date of birth, death, and the length of Geoffrey's life in dog years. In 2019, I designed the Parklet Pavement Art Gallery. A parklet is a parking space repurposed as a recreation space for pedestrians. In order to develop ideas, I started looking at unusual ways the city's pavements were used. London has a tradition of pavement art, perhaps most famously highlighted in Mary Poppins. Pavement artists draw with chalk directly onto the pavement and illustrations last a short period of time before being washed away by rain or scrubbed up underfoot. This image is a pavement artist drawing on the Strand in 1938. This image is a woodcut of a pavement artist from the 1877 edition of Charles Dickens' Christmas Stories. Paving slabs form a canvas for the city's pavement artists. The proposed parklet therefore mounted the slabs onto easels to literally present pavement as canvas. This also made the slabs accessible to allow for the public to interact. The temporary installation also offered an opportunity to enliven the city with colour. The parklet colour scheme was based upon typical classroom chalk colours and individual lengths of timber were painted at random to suggest abstracted lengths of chalk. The easels are deliberately utilitarian in appearance with oversized joists, exposed fixings and plywood gusset plates. Two of the slabs weigh in excess of 100 kilograms so the construction of the easels had to be carefully considered to ensure they were structurally stable. The easels were arranged informally with random sized slabs to offer the appearance of a drawing class. The paving slabs mounted to the easels were York stone, the same type of slab surrounding the site at St Martin's Le Grand and visible throughout the City of London. In the three months before the parklet was removed, over a thousand pieces of chalk were used with members of the public drawing first all over the slabs before moving onto the pavement along St Martin's Le Grand. This year, Wild Goose Chase was shortlisted for the LFA's Power Walks competition to design a walk through the Eastern Cluster area within the City of London. Again, I was interested in how the project could celebrate a hidden history of the city. Creating a walk also provided an opportunity to integrate storytelling using a series of waypoints which in sequence would tell a story about the local context. I chose to tell the tale of Old Tom, a goose that lived in Leadenhall Market during the early 19th century. This image shows Leadenhall Market, which was a poultry and game market, at Christmas in 1845. I again looked at the local context for a means of telling Tom's story. The Eastern Cluster encompasses iconic buildings such as the Gherkin, but also a series of ecclesiastical buildings, all with elaborate stained glass windows. Five stained glass windows showing scenes from Tom's life were therefore proposed, forming a trail across the Eastern Cluster area and concluding at Leadenhall Market. Tom's story is summarised by a plaque within Leadenhall Market. 
The proposed walk tells an improvised version of this tale. Tom's story begins in France. As a young gander, he fell for another goose. However, he was devastated when he discovered her flock was due to fly to England. Unfortunately, Tom had an intense fear of flying, but refused to be left behind and followed his sweetheart on a merchant ship bound for London. Upon arrival in London, Tom realised he was due to be slaughtered in Leadenhall Market. Tom, fearing for his life, overcame his phobia and took flight from the poulterer. Following a series of daring escapes, Tom was granted his freedom. He lived in Leadenhall Market until the age of 37, where he became affectionately known to local traders as Old Tom. The first four of the proposed windows were to be suspended from timber frames at street level, with the final window hung from Leadenhall Market roof. The project might yet be installed by Leadenhall Market once things return to normal. As with stained glass windows, mosaics also present an opportunity for storytelling in architecture. Mosaics are traditionally used in architecture as a form of decoration and became particularly popular during Roman times. London was one of the largest Roman settlements in Britain and a series of their mosaics have been uncovered within the city. The mosaic pictured was found on Leadenhall Street during building work and was transferred to the British Museum in 1880. It is believed to be from the 1st or 2nd century and pictures the Roman god Bacchus. Another Roman mosaic discovered is the Bookersbury mosaic, which is currently on display in the Museum of London. When this mosaic was discovered in 1869, it was visited by over 50,000 people over the course of three days. Beyond Roman times, there are numerous examples of mosaics within the City of London, most prominently the spectacular mosaic ceilings within St Paul's Cathedral. These were designed by British painter William Blake Richmond. His mosaics, which were first revealed to the public in 1896, depict a series of scenes from the Bible. Just outside of the City of London, within Tottenham Court Road Station, are a series of recently restored mosaics by Eduardo Palazzi. Completed in 1986, the mosaics reflect Palazzi's various interests in mechanisation, urbanisation, popular culture and everyday life. More recently within the City of London, a large mosaic was installed at Queen Hyde Duck in 2014. The mosaic by Tessa Hunkin and Southbank Mosaics celebrates the history of London and Queen Hyde Duck in the form of a 30 metre long timeline. The mosaic I'm producing today is going to tell the story of Old Tom. You could equally choose to commemorate Old Tom, but there are plenty of other interesting tales about the City of London that could be celebrated in your own mosaic. For inspiration, you could watch Uptown Talks on the Museum of London website. This is a series of free online videos about London's weird and wonderful secrets. In order to produce the mosaic, you will require the following items. Mosaic backer board. I'll be using a sheet of MDF for my mosaic. Mosaic tiles. I'll be using glass mosaic tiles, which are available from craft retailers. A tile nipper. This will be used to trim down tiles. PVA adhesive. This is for sticking the tiles onto the backer board. Unsanded grout. I'm using a white grout that is typically used for bathroom tiles. A grout spatula. This will be used to spread the grout between the tiles. A kitchen sponge. This is used to remove any stray grout from the tile faces. White paint and a paintbrush. I'm going to paint the background of my mosaic, but you could equally choose to tile yours. I'm using a mineral-based low VOC paint. I think the most exciting moment in Tom's story is his daring escape, so this is the scene I've decided to illustrate. My mosaic will show Tom taking flight from the poulterer's cleaver. When you have decided upon what you would like to illustrate in your mosaic, the first step is to roughly draw the scene. In order to draw Tom, I'm using a series of reference images of geese to help me get his proportions correct. As you can see, I've started drawing Tom quite roughly, but I'm gradually refining the sketch using tracing paper. The drawing doesn't have to be completely accurate, as it is just to provide a guide for when you start setting out your mosaic tiles. In terms of inspiration for your scene, there are many examples of amazing mosaic murals from Soviet Ukraine. These are documented in the book Decommunized by photographer Yevhen Nikforov. Decommunization is the process of removing the Soviet legacy in Ukraine. Ukraine officially began decommunization in 2015, 
with legislation outlawing communist and Soviet symbols. As a result, many of these mosaics have since disappeared from public space. The mosaic pictured is from the side elevation of the Institute for Nuclear Research in Kiev. Once you have a sketch of your proposed mosaic, the next step is to begin setting out your mosaic tiles. Using my sketch as a reference image, I'm placing the tiles in the same arrangement that I will glue them down later. In a similar way to sketching, I'm initially setting down tiles to form the outlines of my scene, and I'm using coloured tiles to infill between the lines. The mosaic tiles I'm using are square, so I'll be using a tile nipper to cut them down to shape where required. This should be done using eye protection. Carefully place your tile into the tile nipper and place the nipper over a plastic container. Cover the nipper with your other hand to prevent cut tiles from flying away. I'm setting out the tiles to follow the contours of Tom's body and wings, which should help the mosaic feel more 3D. In terms of choice of colour, I'm using a colour gradient of mostly white, grey and blue tiles for Tom's feathers to give some additional depth to the image. In order to avoid solid stripes of colour, I'm mixing up the tiles as well. Having laid out the tiles for Tom, I'm tiling a dark outline to make the mosaic stand out from the page. Although I'm using tiles for my mosaic, there are lots of examples of mosaics using a range of mixed media. The image shown is a mosaic called The Tree of Knowledge by Alan Boyson. This mural was installed in 1962 and was commissioned by Cruikshank and Seaward architects who designed the school building to which the mosaic is fixed. The mosaic depicts a stylized tree of knowledge with songbirds, flowers and an owl. The illustration is formed of ceramics, tiles, concrete and pebbles. The mosaic was Grade 2 listed in 2009. The Historic England listing states the mural is a good example of the integration between art and architecture and the 1950s and 60s policy of enhancing communities by installing art within the public realm. I'm now going to use PVA to glue the tiles down to the backer board sticking the dark outline tiles down first and working my way inwards towards the centre of the mosaic. As PVA tends to push tiles a little further apart than when they were set out loosely, you might find you require a few less tiles than you originally used. I've applied the glue quite heavily but this shouldn't matter as this will be concealed once the mosaic is grouted. A more recent mosaic features in A House for Essex by Grayson Perry and Fat Architecture. This house is a mausoleum to a fictional character, Julie Cope. The elaborate interiors tell Julie's story through a variety of artworks, tapestries and the architecture itself. The entrance hallway floor is a large mosaic of a school, marking the spot where Julie's husband first heard of her death. Now the glue has fully dried, which I've left overnight, I'm going to use the grout to infill the spaces between tiles. I'm applying the grout liberally and using the spatula to push the grout between the tiles whilst gradually working my way across the surface of the mosaic. The grout tends to stick to the tile faces. In order to remove as much of this as possible, I'm scrubbing the tile surface lightly with a clean spatula. At the edges of the mosaic, I'm using the edge of a spatula to remove any excess grout, then a damp sponge to wipe the surface of the MDF clear. After about two hours, once the grout is partially dry, I'm using the rough side of a sponge scourer to clear any stray grout off the tile faces. I'm going to paint the exposed areas of my backer board white. Alternatively, you may choose to fully tile your background, but I like the idea of expressing the depth of the tiles. I'm initially going to use a wide brush, followed by a smaller brush, where additional precision is required. Here is the completed mosaic of Tom escaping the poulterer's cleaver. Overall, this took just under two days to complete, but something smaller scale could be finished in a shorter time. I'm now going to show a time lapse of the full process of making this mosaic.
hope you've enjoyed this video and have had fun making your own mosaics. Please share any images of your own mosaics via Instagram and tag London Mosaic and LFA 2020. Before I finish, I'd like to credit Kilnbridge, Tarmac, EWM Bespoke Interiors, Marshalls, the University of Westminster, Solid Geometry Structural Engineers and Pruitt Bisley Architects, all of whom have helped in the production of the projects presented. This workshop is part of the City's Our City Together programme and LFA Digital. Thanks for attending.